Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name's Jerry Ryder, and it's my pleasure today to introduce you to our presenters. Uh, we have four speakers. Uh, Jens Klump will be our first speaker. He is a geochemist by training and is science leader of Earth Science Informatics in the Mineral Resources Unit of CSIRO. And importantly, he's also vice president of the International Geosample Num Number Implementation Organization, which you'll touch on a little bit in his presentation. After Brent, after Jens, uh, we'll hear from Brent McGuinness, who's a research professor at Curtin University and director of the John DeLater Centre in Perth. Uh, he has more than 26 years of international experience in the geoscience and research, resource resources research sector. Then we'll hear from Joel Ben, who's the manager, manager of DevOps with the ARDC, where he's worked for more than five years um, as part of the development team delivering online services such as Research Data Australia and the DOI and Handle Minting services. And Joel will be giving us a live demo of the IGSN system. And then finally, we'll hear from Leslie Wyborn, um, who's based at the ANU uh, with the NCI and the Research School of Earth Sciences. And uh, Leslie will be talking to us about the future of IGSN. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jens as our first speaker. Thanks, Jens. Thank you, Jerry, for the introduction and thank you for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, I would like to give you a short introduction about what IGSNs are, where they come from, and what you can use them for. Um, just as a very dry definition, IGSNs are persistent, globally unique, web-resolvable identifiers for physical samples. Some people call physical sample specimens. Um, anyway, um, the pictures on the slide show you some applications where IGSNs have been used. It's quite a wide a range of samples. They're not all geological. Some They can be used for anything that is a physical sample. And that is an important aspect for the future development. So what, what does persistent mean in this long string of this definition? Um, those who have been around on the internet for a while have noticed that URLs go away. Sometimes we need to change the arrangements of servers and how they're organized and whatever technology changes. Things change and over time that links to phenomenon called link rot where links just don't work anymore. And persistent identifiers were designed to deal with this problem. So what they do is they will always resolve to a so-called landing page even when the URL changes, or sometime in the future when URLs will no longer be used. Um, HTTP as a protocol on the web has been around for 25 years, and I don't expect it to be around for another 25 years, but the record of science, we hope, will be around for centuries. So um, there are other examples of persistent identifiers, and the most popular ones you will probably know as DOIs, digital object identifiers, and handles. They're actually technologically all the same, but I won't go into that today. A very important aspect is this aspect of identifiers being globally unique. And this map gives you two examples of what uniqueness might mean. On the left-hand side is a list of identifiers that can be found in the literature for a sample that has this um, strange name of argon 003 in the PetDB database. And in the literature, it has about a dozen different names where one can assume that they all refer to the same object, but you can't really be sure. Um, so having an identifier that gives a unique identity to the specimen would be really helpful. The example on the right-hand side is a map of the world listing all the samples from EarthChem with the name M1. So M1 seems to be everywhere, and especially in Japan. And as a, as a material, it's anything geological. So M1 obviously isn't a globally unique name, and it's also not very useful to identify materials. 
So there's this aspect of web resolvable. And just at the top of the page, I gave you the URL of the page where I took the screenshot, something long complicated that is likely to change in the near future. But just below that is the IGSN, the arrow points to the big bold IGSN. And underneath is just as an example, how this um, particular IGSN is resolved by using a HandleNet resolving server. Um, usually this should all be encapsulated in the applications and you shouldn't worry about it, but sometimes you need to, and this is an example of how you would resolve it. You can actually do this with any DOI or handle through HandleNet or DOI resolvers. And then at the bottom of the page is um, an example of what the what this specimen was called in the field. So somebody in this Hammersley Basin project called it HM-96B, which um, might or not be not be unique. But um, so what I want to show with this slide is that you can call things in your applications in the lab or in the field with the with a locally unique name, something that makes sense to you, but to make it globally unique, um, this is where the IGSN comes in, like maybe a passport number or social security number for a specimen. So why would we want to use IGSNs? Um, as I already mentioned, sample names are locally unique, hopefully, that should be part of your good housekeeping, but they're usually not unique in a global context. And so what it enables us, if once we um, assign these globally unique identifiers, we can um, use these identifiers to make exact references to samples in data and literature. So the thing that I showed you from the Pacific with a dozen different names, if we had an exact reference, we would know what we're talking about, or we would be able to refer the many M1s to specifically individual samples. And having all these samples uniquely identified would also allow us to compile large scale catalogs and overviews um, for overview studies. Very practically, uh, having identifiers would also help us track samples through varying institutions. Samples sometimes do move around. They move between institutions. They move from a lab to a repository. They move from one lab to another. And so this can also serve as a tracking number. It's not just another label on a box. And so because we can now tie a sample to a data set to a publication, um, it also allows us to verify sample-based data. Um, many models use some data set based on some sample as a ground truth element, and it's at the moment very difficult to go back to that ground truth. And having an IGSN would help us finding those ground truth evidence bits. So what can I use the IGSN for? Um, as I said in my opening statement, you can use it for any kind of physical sample. Historically, it's the international geo sample number, but it's not limited to ge geological samples. And um, so we're thinking of how we can re-engineer the acronym to mean something more global. What you can also use it for is something that is not physical, something that we call a sampling feature, that is the thing where the sample was taken from. So a borehole is not a thing, it's a hole in the ground. It's not a physical object, but it's a sampling feature that we need to identify to relate the cores that were taken from this hole to this borehole, or a site which might be an outcrop or a sampling site somewhere where something was taken from nature. Um, this might sound like a bit of a distraction from physical objects, but we need this to identify where things came from. And since there's nothing else in place, this was a very pragmatic decision to also make this a feature of the system. Same, um, also not a physical object, is when you aggregate samples into some kind of a collection, um, like a box of samples or a string of pieces from a drill core or some 
things in that that were caught together in the net that have some share some association. This ag aggregation of samples can also be identified with an IGSN. And then very common procedures that we take subsamples from an existing sample, and these can also be identified and then related to the to the parent object. So IGSN can also link to other IGSNs like the parent-child relationship or um, specimen to um, collection or specimen to feature. We can also relate them to DOIs in data and literature and to other persistent identifiers through um, element called related identifier. And this is a feature that we share with data sites. So we can, data site objects can also refer to IGSNs. So there's this mutual co connection between the two systems. And in this um, figure, I want to illustrate to you how things can then relate to each other. So we have a specimen that's identified with an IGSN. Uh, on this particular piece of kaolinite, we measured an infrared spectrum. This data set is then identified with the DOI and stored in the CSIRO data access portal. And then this spectrum is part of a publication where it is interpreted. This publication is identified with the DOI. And then it, you can go back from this publication uh, with this provenance trail and go back to the specimen and, and find out what was it that was analyzed. And um, in this particular example of, of spectra measured on, on rock specimens, um, we had a project where we made sure that the thing we measured was actually what we thought we were measuring, so that kaolinite was actually kaolinite and not something else. Um, and if you had any doubts from the publication, you could go all the way back and find the sample where this data set was derived. To give you a bit of background and global context on IGSN, um, IGSN and data site evolved about at the same time in the mid 2000s. And um, when we had some conversations about how to implement this, uh, around 2007, samples were seen out of scope for the precursor of DataCite. Pre DataCite was founded in 2009. So this is the historical reason why this is not one system. But there are also other reasons at the moment still in the way we govern the system that um, make it valid to go in parallel but not as the same organization. The IGSN implementation organization was founded in 2011 and at present has four members in Australia, CSRO, who joined in 2013, Geoscience Australia, who joined in 2014, Curtin University joining in 2015, and Australia Research Data Commons, back then still ends in 20, 2017. So that's a bit of an illustration. There are about 20 members in a number of countries on various continents starting to show kind of a global spread. Um, and it's showing some impact that Leslie will be talking about uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, there are other persistent identifiers around. I've already mentioned data site, um, but in relation to identifying specimens, I think IGSN plays a really important role because at the moment we have 6.5 million samples registered. There are a couple of hundred registered with DataCite, but um, it's important to point out that DataCite metadata are not suited for samples. They are very well suited for bibliographic objects and data, but not for physical specimens. A very big player in this area was the life science identifier, LSRD, but it was kind of ahead of its time and that limited um, adoption and eventually the system broke down and was discontinued last year. And the biodiversity community reverted back to a URL based system, which they say is just an intermediate measure until they find something else that works, but they have to find something now. So they um, step back to using what they call 
cool your eyes. And that's all I wanted to tell you about IGSN from my perspective. And now I hand over to Brent to give you the university perspective. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brent McInnes. I'm the professor of economic geology and geochemistry and the executive director of the John Glader Center Labs at Curtin University. I also have a role as a national coordinator of OSCOPE's Earth Composition and Evolution Program, which involves multiple laboratories around the nation. Um, I'm speaking to you today with two hats on. Um, the, um, the key, the key uh, thing about the John Delater Center, if you don't know, it's a centralized analytical facility at Curtin University. Um, it uh, consists of 14 laboratories, uh, 25 staff, uh, and they're operating over $33 million of high-end analytical facilities. Um, these labs provide analytical services to, to over 550 uh, unique researchers. Uh, the labs operate um, for these, provide research services to these uh, individuals um, about 27,000 hours a year of analytical time. So the data volumes being generated are, are, are quite high. Um, the, 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 actually, the, the volumes are, could, could not be considered high relative to perhaps um, satellite data or something. Probably we, we generate about 10 to 12 terabytes of data per year, which is actually not very much, but the data is high value data in that um, the data can be used to assess perhaps the petroleum potential of a, a basin, uh, could be able to provide you with the, the age or thermal history of a, of, a, of a rock sample or a mineral belt, um, or it could provide information perhaps about the, the, uh, the health of an ecosystem. Um, so with that perspective, we have a, a problem in terms of data management and uh, data delivery. Um, and what we realized that we needed to do was we need to come up with a better system of disseminating uh, the data sets to our researchers than, than simply allowing them to, to take the data on a thumb drive um, or a, uh, uh, a hard drive. And so we, we wondered if we could create a system in the laboratory that would automatically capture uh, data uh, about the samples and make it um, available and reusable in, in the future. So as an example of the, the instrument suites that we, uh, we have uh, at Curtin, um, a lot of them are uh, mass spectrometry uh, systems or um, uh, imaging systems such as scanning electron microscopes or TEMs. Uh, and so these are the, the sort of, um, of uh, uh, of instruments we're talking about in the operational hours. And in general, each researcher has between 10 and 100 samples uh, per, per, per year. So you can imagine there's a lot of information if you're trying to capture it in a systematic way. So we, we did a trial. Uh, here's an example of um, uh, so some samples uh, that were uh, collected from the Geological Survey of Western Australia, uh, the samples on the right-hand side. Think of them as uh, grains of sand. They are uh, cast in epoxy mounts. Um, in total, the, there are about 5,700,000 grains of sand uh, in, those, in those samples uh, collectively. But what they are is they're heavy mineral concentrates that the, the, the geological survey collected when they went into the field to do their, their mapping and survey pro programs. Um, and we were able to use this instrument in the bottom left-hand corner um, to automatically uh, uh, measure the, the mineralogy and the chemistry of those samples uh, after eight days of continuous operation. So um, with 200 samples here and a lot, of, uh, a lot of individual analysis, we were automatically faced with a sample and data management, made management problem. Uh, so uh, we worked with Oscope and ANS to, to come up with a system of, uh, uh, of uh, figuring out how to actually identify the samples 
because we uh, we saw that there was going to be a problem um, with the the M1 problem that uh, that Jens talked about um, if we started systematically uh, doing these analysis for other projects that there would be uh, theoretically a high probability of duplicating the sample numbers and uh, quickly realized that the the IGSN uh, system was uh, the, the best system to adopt. Uh, for the for the project. So um, a number of things that we've done is we've incorporated the IGSN um, number into a QR code system um, on the sample, which um, permanently identifies the sample. Um, we've actually made that data set available, so you can actually go and look at the, the data set and, and uh, explore the mineralogy. The minerals are classified by chemistry. So on the far right hand bottom corner of that slide, you can see that um, there's different colors and those different colors uh, represent the chemistry, which is then uh, uh, reflected in the mineralogy. So anything red is a titanium dioxide or a rutile a grain. Anything in blue is a zirconium silicate uh, and so forth. Um, you can actually go to the, the website and find information about that. One of the things that we found out is that um, over 15% of these samples contain minerals of economic interest. Uh, and so that um, could be of interest to uh, exploration companies, or certainly people are now wanting to access these samples to do uh, in enhanced uh, geochemical uh, uh, studies on them, uh, looking at neodymium isotopes and some um, uh, strontium isotope data on some of these samples. So now, um, for samples that were previously stored on the shelf at the, the Geological Survey of Western Australia, they're now um, uh, available for, for reuse and interrogation of the data sets. And not only mineralogy, but you can get chemistry data. The IGSN number is, uh, for this uh, particular sample here, um, is actually uh, embedded into the, the QR code. So you can actually take your smartphone and zoom in on that QR code and all the sample information comes up along with the, the data analysis. So we like to think that this is something that can be used not only uh, at Curtin, but used at laboratories around the country. So from a research perspective, um, I wanted to, to give you my personal opinions uh, on, on how this will um, change, if not revolutionize, the way we collaborate and cooperate. Um, I've put on here, I borrowed a slide from, um, from uh, DA, um, Elena, Elena Basakova, and this shows where you can, um, the IGS and impl implementation at Geoscience Australia, where they have over 1.6 million samples registered. The fact that they do this makes the samples discoverable online. And um, uh, the perspective here is that if we were all to do this, uh, we would actually be able to know, you know, uh, where can I get samples or, or, or who can I collaborate with? Is my idea original? Is somebody else already done work in this area? Um, you know, do I need to add into my proposal a fieldwork component if I can ac access the sample somewhere else? In some places in Australia, it's very difficult to get access. You, you have permitting issues, it can take time, a lot of bureaucracy. Um, and so if you can actually, if the samples exist somewhere else, it's, uh, it's good to know. Um, and I think it will benefit people who, wish, who are interested in, in true collaboration. Um, maybe you're an expert in one area of mineralogy, but you're not an expert in isotope geochemistry. Somebody might contact you and say, hey, can I, access your samples and collaborate. And I think it's gonna really change the way we do business. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, when you review grant proposals, you might look at uh, whether or not they actually need to get field work funded if, the, if those samples might exist somewhere else. So I think that in, in the long term, IGSN will, will actually change the way we do business, how we work with each other, um, how we win grants and how we uh, receive recognition for our work. So I'm really excited about it, and, and I hope you are too. Thank you. Um, it's Joel Ben from ARDC. I'm going to give a quick overview of the ARDC IGSN service. Um, 
So the, the IDSEN service um, was implemented as a collaboration between Oscope ANS and CSIRO, and it was implemented as part of a, a geosciences data enhanced virtual laboratory project. And that project was funded by ANS, uh, Nectar and RDS, who have now formed to become ARDC. Uh, the service itself is free and it's intended for use by the Australian Earth Science Research Community. Um, now, it, it's a service that is, I guess, self-service. So your institution or organisation doesn't have to maintain an account or sign up and manage um, software in any way. It's, it's hosted by ARDC and anyone with an AAF login um, can access the service and mint my GSNs for their samples. Um, it's accessed at via the Oscope website um, and as I said it's it's accessed via an AEF um, login um, we do have means of um, providing users without AEF logins um, access to the service as well so um, to do that you'd need to get in touch with the ARDC. Um, in terms of minting an IGSEN uh, there's a minimum, minimum metadata that has to be provided in terms of uh, minting and I'll go through that once I get into the actual web form in a second um, and I also just wanted to point out being a persistent identifier, there's also some responsibilities for the, uh, I guess, the minter of that IGSN um, to maintain um, the metadata within that IGSN, that's the descriptive metadata of that IGSN, and also the ability for that IGSN to resolve. Now, the resolvability um, side of things, when you're using the ARDC IGSN web interface is taken care of for you. So uh, when you mint an IGSN, it actually creates a metadata page for you, and that is where the IGSN will resolve to. Um, when you're using the API, it's a little bit different. You will either need to host um, the, uh, the, the page that gets resolved to, or we can uh, do something for you um, in a future release. Um, at the moment, the service is really obviously because it was um, implemented as part of the geosciences project, it is really um, limited a little bit to the geosciences sort of samples, and that's mainly because of the metadata um, sort of schema that's that's being used to describe samples is for geosciences. Um, but we are very interested in extending the service out to other domains and disciplines. Um, and the best way to sort of uh, get in touch with us would be via the ARDC service desk, so services at ans.org.au, um, and we can sort of uh, talk through that process. Um, the last point is just that we do have an API available um, for machine to machine minting. So if there are services or tools uh, that are creating lots of samples or want to do this in an automated way, but there is an API available. Um, and again, get in contact with services at ANS and we can set up accounts and, and go through how that would be tested. So what I'm going to do is uh, just go through how users access the service. And as I said, um, it's via the Oscope website. So I'll just flick over to the Oscope website. Um, please let me know if they can't see the, the browser. Um, so this is the page on the Oscope website. So you can see the URL at the top there. It's oscope.org.au, um, idsn-info. Um, and this just gives you a little bit of, a, sort of info about the service and sort of the, uh, I guess, the responsibilities of the users of the service. Um, and then at the bottom there is a link to access the service. So when I click that, it redirects me off to um, Rapid Connect or AAF login, um, and that's where you can pick your institution to log in. Um, so I'll scroll down to the ANU and then click continue. And then this will bounce me to my organization's AAF login, where I can enter my details. Password right, once I've logged in. I'll land into the service. So that's, I've accessed via the ANU AF, and it's basically once I've authenticated, it's redirected me into um, the ARDC IGSN service. Um, so that was the login process, but what I'm going to do is just flick over to the test system so that I'm not actually minting um, production IGSNs as I go through this. Um, the, the form that you land on when you log in is sort of the registration form. So this is the form where you will uh, fill out the, the metadata to mint an IGSN. And as I said earlier, there are a number of sort of minimum fields that you have to provide in order to mint an IGSN. Um, so you have to provide uh, the, the object type. Um, so there's a set of options and it's defaulted to physical uh, sample. And then you can see the fields that are highlighted in red. And there's, these are the mandatory uh, fields that you need to provide as a minimum. Um, the metadata visibility. So you have a couple of options there. You can have it publicly visible. 
uh, completely private, so no one will be able to find that in terms of uh, the, ANS, the ARDC IGSN service, um, and also it won't be harvested out through our OAI endpoint publicly. There's also the option to put it under an embargo period um, where you can enter sort of the end date for that embargo and when that elapses, that metadata will become public in the service and also via uh, our OAI endpoint. Um, you have to specify obviously the sample or item type um, and also the material type. So there's, if you drop down, there's obviously a number of sort of types there to choose from, um, which come from um, known vocabs. Uh, the other thing to point out is there obviously is um, some in-context help, so there's little icons um, with each of the fields where you can click and it will give you a little bit of help for filling out those fields. The other field that is required is obviously the curator, um, so this can be uh, an individual, it could be uh, say a role at an institution, um, and it's, it's obviously good to have that information up to date, so if someone does find uh, the metadata for your sample, they can get in contact with whoever it is to get access to that sample or find more information about that sample. So this is really important to keep, as I said earlier, up-to-date um, information in. Now as we go further down, um, there is additional metadata around the IGSN. Um, so obviously a location is quite important for a lot of samples. Um, so you can describe the location of where the sample was collected were taken. Uh, related resources, so this is, I think Ian sort of touched on this earlier, where there is uh, the ability to link between uh, resources, so this might be a link between say uh, two DOIs or two IGSNs themselves, so there might be a hierarchy between those samples and you can do that in the related resources. Under contributors, you can obviously uh, put in anybody that's uh, contributed in any way to this sample um, and there is a number of uh, roles that you can choose from, so there's things from uh, funder, owner, um, stakeholders and you can describe those by putting in um, their name at the role and there's even a, a spot there to put say their, their identifier which could be an ORCID or, or an NLA identifier. On the last tab um, there's other information to I, I guess extend uh, the richness of the metadata around the IGSN. Um, so alternate identifiers, so uh, this might be um, you have a local identifier within your systems to represent that sample and you can describe that here. Uh, classifications, purpose, the sample feature, so the feature that was sampled to get this um, actual sample or core or whatever it is. Uh, the data collection um, you can put in here as well and also link to um, so the method of collection, the project, so this is where you might want to link to say um, a grant that or a project um, that has basically funded the collection of the sample and any comments you can provide in here. Um, now going back up to sort of the minimum uh, metadata, there's, it's obviously um, to get your IGSM that's all you need but in terms of having a really rich metadata record for discoverability and I guess assessment from other users, it's really important I guess to, to fill out those other fields further down the page. Um, now once you have minted a resource, you have access to all the resources under this list resources page and you can see here that I've got all the, all the samples that I've minted previously. Um, I can go into any of these and I can edit them. So this is one that I've done before. Um, all the fields are filled out, you can see that I've got um, spatial location and you can basically change any of the metadata in there. So it might be that the curator has changed or the institution or um, there's additional information in terms of the project that you might want to add and I'll just click update to, to take me off to the metadata view of this page. So this is basically the how I'm updating is the same sort of process as you go through to mint. Um, you'll get this pop-up where it says that it's been minted, in this case it was actually updated and you get a couple of options. So you can view the metadata and that will navigate you to the metadata page for this IGSM. You can add another that will give you a blank uh, form to add another one or you can click OK and basically OK leaves the form filled out um, with all the same information because you may have another sample that's very similar and you can basically just tweak the information and mint another IGSM with that option. Um, in terms of uh, the IGSM um, resolve um, being able to resolve the IGSN, sorry, um, it's underpinned by the handle service, so you can use the handle infrastructure to resolve the IGSNs, and you can see here that we have the full resolvable link for the IGSN that I've just updated. And if I click that, it'll basically take me to the same page as I would have gone to with that view metadata link. So this is where I said earlier that the in terms of using the, the ARDC IGSM web interface, we provide that um, landing page for your IGSMs for you, so you don't have to worry about hosting a page anywhere on your systems. 
So this is the view page uh, for the metadata. So this is what it, um, someone will resolve their IG, the IGSM to or will discover um, through a service. And it's basically all the fields that you've just filled out are available in a read-only mode. If you are logged in, there is an edit button so you can go in and, and make changes. Um, if it's not publicly visible, so if you've set it to private or it's still under embargo, the user will actually, when they resolve it, they'll come into a uh, basically a, lo a login page. And if they don't have access, they won't be able to view your metadata. There is uh, the QR code up the top here. So if you did scan that with your, say, your mobile device, um, it will come up with the full resolvable URL for the IGSM, and then you can obviously access the metadata. Um, I think that's most. Uh, there's a link up the top, obviously, to documentation. So there's help on how to fill out the form and how things uh, work. But there's also some information on the API in there as well. I think the only other thing to point out was um, when a when you mint an IGSN, you actually receive an email to say that you've minted and a link back to the system so that you can um, sort of uh, track it and edit those going forward. And the email that's used is the email that's uh, associated with your AAF login. So uh, that's where you'll receive those emails. Well, I think uh, that's pretty much everything from me. Uh, thanks, Joel. I'll just hand over now to Leslie. Um, okay, so I just, as a, Jens said, uh, Kirsten Lynn and I have been kind of developing this system and playing around with it with a heap of other people since about 2007. And we designed it originally to be within the geoscience community. We knew there were life science identifiers and other systems around. And we were happily pottering around until all of a sudden we realised we were almost the last man standing. And what we also noticed was that people were starting to um, use it for all sorts of things um, just because they were desperate to get an ID system for a physical sample. And I wonder whether it is the ability for IGSN to link to samples and data and derive from the sample and to publications has made it extremely popular. And it is now being used beyond the original intention for geoscience domains. And the growth is phenomenal, as um, Ian said, it's up to 6.8 million samples. We've had inquiries from museums, from anthropologies, etc. And it was getting too big. And the growth into the other domains needed to be moderated because you can't just take some of the geoscience standards we were using them and applying them to bio and other samples. And so what we thought was, can we identify a key common kernel attribute across the domains? We also knew that the governance model needed to be strengthened because we, it was bad enough within the geoscience domain, but it was spreading to other domains. And we were starting to have um, not very good, what I would call community behavior. Um, people were actually minting toys, but not registering, so minting IGSNs, but not registering them. They were not following the agreed protocols. And then independently, we had a few examples of people, say, developing um, vocabularies and other technical things and calling them IGSN. And at no stage had they put them through the IGSN technical community or let the governance body know that this was happening. And people were starting to put their own spin on things, so we didn't really have a consistent message about IGSN and what it's for. So um, Santa Claus comes around, i.e. the Sloan Foundation. <laughs> they heard us talking about this at one of their at one of our outreach events, and they asked us to, to consider a grant. And we heard about two or three weeks ago that we have been given this grant for 20 months, starting on 1st of August. It's going to establish a solid executable plan for the future of IGSN that will enable new organisations to participate easily and confidently, but more importantly, our system will work in that um, physical samples will be integrated into the research data ecosystem. So you can see on the right, one of our key things is to identify what is that common kernel. And then from there, you can work out, as, Jen, as Joel said, we've got these fields for extra descriptions, make the metadata richer which will be done hopefully through a series of controlled vocabularies that are specific to the domain that is setting up the sample. 
And on the right, you can see I've got the common kernel. And I know, for example, um, with um, marine samples, um, something like grain size, so they can borrow the grain size vocabulary that sits in the geological um, GSIML vocabularies. Um, and there's lots of flexibilities, but what we want is that key common identifier, that key common kernel that'll go across multiple domains. And so what we're going to get use the funding for is a series of workshops for international experts. And data site are still with us and are coming on board. So again, we'll keep that parallelism that we have had with data site to make sure what we come up with, we can integrate with data site. And we're going to slightly redesign it and its management to be able to use IGSN with confidence. And the experts are from the US, the UK, France, Australia. Um, the representatives from Australia, from CSIRO and ARDC, um, Japan and um, South Africa. And I've given you a link to a blog which is kind of describing um, where we're going to be going in the next couple of years. And um, we think it's exciting. For example, in bio, we now have Tadwig on board. Um, and archaeology is coming out of Macquarie University. So um, I think it's the best thing that's happened to us. And um, yeah, I think I'll just finish there and hand over back to Jerry. However, I do uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. If you just move on to the next slide, that'll be fine. It's just got some links on there um, that people can follow uh, to find out more. So thank you to all our presenters um, for a, a really informative uh, set of presentations. We've now got time for questions. We do have one question um, already uh, from Barbara, and I think it may have been for you, Brent, um, where she asks about uh, whether you put the human readable IGSN on the sample as well as the QR code. Would you be able to respond to that one, please, Brent? Uh, yes, um, both are, are there. Um, in fact, we we have th three ways of identifying the sample. <clears throat> There's the original sample identification uh, number, which you may assign in the field. It could be your own personal number. Then there's the um, uh, the IGSN assigned or minted uh, number, um, and then uh, where we can, we'll, we'll we'll print out a QR code and attach it to the sample as well. Thank you. Um, uh, now this one may be for you, Jens. Uh, Andrew's asking, how are the IGS, IGSN numbers assigned? The examples used don't seem to be random. That's a very good question, and that's a core question in the way we set up IGSN. Um, one analogy that I like to use in how we make sure and how we how we allocate the names is, is the way that um, license plates for cars are allocated. So there's a system in place that makes sure that license plates in Australia are unique for every car. Um, and But this, the, how is this is handled is very different from state to state and territory to territory. Um, to, and, and this pattern that's called hierarchical delegation um, this pattern allows us to accommodate the specific needs in the specific applications of IGSN. So one example here for field campaigns, um, we have little booklets printed like raffle tickets with, with unique numbers. And then when the sample is taken in the field, this raffle ticket is put into the bag with a sample. In other campaigns, we've pre-printed labels with IGSNs and QR codes that and then the QR code could be scanned into a mobile app that helped capture the metadata for the sampling process. In other cases, the samples already exist with locally unique identifiers in the database. And then we um, use a prefix before the locally unique database number um, to make this a globally unique identifier. So the way this is handled depends quite a lot on the specific situation and the governance that we set up 
is exactly tailored to be able to handle all this variation in pro how we identify samples. Uh, thank you, Jens. Uh, another question, maybe for you again, from Anthony, who asks, who owns the metadata and how is intellectual property being dealt with? Um, so there's two ways to look at this. The one is the um, is the merit, of course, whoever creates information has a, an ownership in it. From a legal perspective, um, as in other catalogs, um, the metadata are open to everybody because otherwise you can't compile them into global catalogs and you run into all sorts of legal entanglement licensing problems if you put restrictive um, rules on the metadata. Um, so the I hope that answers your question. That from a legal licensing perspective, metadata are open, but of course we acknowledge the intellectual merit that goes into creating them. Thank you, Jens. It's uh, always a tricky question about intellectual property. Uh, Joel, a couple for you. Um, uh, Helen wants to know, is it possible to upload a large group of details that are similar but need IGSN, for example, from a spreadsheet? Um, so where there's repeating data, uh, but many samples? Um, not at the moment. So the bulk functionality is only really available if you wrote, say, um, a script with the API. Um, but it is something that we have with our other services, so we would be looking at that sometime in the future, no doubt. Uh, but at the moment, the only real way to do that sort of bulk import would be via the API. Okay, thanks. And I know um, your team, Joel, is ha happy to help people get the API up and running. Yep, of course. Um, and uh, Barbara's asking the best website to go to for the metadata scheme and associated vocabularies. Um, you can go through the documentation um, page, which is linked from the service, or through uh, the ANS website. There is information on the IGSN service where you can find the metadata scheme. Um, the metadata was the scheme was developed by CSIRO um, for their project needs, um, but it has been sort of accepted, I guess, by the, the GEO community so far. Um, I think there is work going forward to, to review that. Um, and the, the vocabs that are used. And obviously, uh, Leslie also touched on some work on that sort of core metadata kernel that will happen. Um, but yeah, to answer the question shortly, the, the ANS website um, would be the best place to check. Um, okay. Someone's expressing a concern with the different levels for which an IGSN can be used, for example, borehole, sample, and subsample. How is that resolved in detail? I'm not, that's not a clear question to me, I'm afraid. Jens. So um, this example of boreholes and materials coming from that and then being subsampled, this is very nicely illustrated by a use case from the International Continental Scientific Drilling Program, where they've used IGSN to identify boreholes in one of their projects and then all the materials that came from these operations. And um, the, the link between all these objects is the related identifier element in the metadata, where you can refer from a parent object to a child object or from a child object to a parent object. And um, in the IGSN documentation on GitHub, this example is um, listed. And when you resolve this IGSN, it takes you to a very nice page that I had on one of my screens, um, which actually has this tree structure of um, dependencies between objects very well illustrated and interactive so you can go from one level to the next and from one object to the other and display the um, 
associated metadata in pretty great detail. Okay, and a follow-up question. Um, I'm not quite sure who on the panel can answer this one, but the demonstrated way to register an IGSM would take a, at least a minute. If GA had one person doing nothing else, they would be able to register about 100,000 samples a year. So how did they manage to register 1.6 million? I think that was actually globally rather than GA. Uh, well, GA did register more than 2 million samples, and they did that through using the API. Um, the API was actually the original way to register um, IGSN, and um, adding web forms was a later addition to accommodate the needs of individual researchers. Our original, our not original, but our initial target group to grow the system quickly were large organizations like National Geological Surveys with large collections, and they would then use the API for sample registration. Okay, thank you, Jens. Um, a comment that it, it seems that the effectiveness of the service is strongly dependent on institutions maintaining a, a museum or archive system for their samples, which is unlikely in many institutions because of costs. Does anybody in the panel wish to respond to that? Um, one short remark is that when we talk about persistence, there's sometimes a confusion between what is supposed to be persistent and what not. And what we require in the system to be persistent is the description. The sample itself might not be available. Sometimes we do destructive analyses, and after that analysis, the sample is gone. Uh, so you won't be able to keep it. But you want to keep the information about it and its identity. And that minimum is something that um, that is what is required. But there are other aspects to it that Brent and Leslie might also refer to. I guess what I could say is that, um, yeah, this is a phenomenal problem around the world. And in geology, samples are being ditched. They're very expensive to store. And so one of the turning it around is, as Brent said, um, maybe we can cut down on the number of samples if we carefully curate what they are, like how many trips do you need to the Galapagos Islands to collect those samples? Or if they're properly registered, they can be reused. And so we're starting to build a case for uh, maybe fewer samples, but better managed. And the other more important thing, as Jan said, is now that we can share samples so easily through this system, like they're not boxes sitting in people's cupboards. Um, we are bringing to the front the fact that samples, if they're properly curated, can be reused. And it makes it easy for you to go to the funders to say, well, here's a suite of samples that should be preserved because um, you know, they're well described, they've got identifiers, we can connect to the data, and the funders can actually start to see another purpose other than boxes and boxes of rocks that have got the numbers M1, M2, M3. Also, when you take the national collections, like the National Insect Collection or the National Herbarium, um, these collections already exist and are reference collections, and I see a, a lot of value in um, identifying these samples. The Biodiversity World has been working on this for many, many years, and unfortunately, their attempt at the life science identifier broke down last year. It had, I won't go into the details of why this happened, but um, we're making a new attempt together with the biodiversity community to um, make sharing of these resources easier. Thanks, Jens. Uh, one last I, question I, before we have, oh, sorry, Brent. I'd just like to add my personal perspective. I mean, I think we can all share um, horror stories around uh, samples being, being chucked out. 
but, and uh, so we've started a pilot project uh, where we uh, identified uh, researchers who are uh, near retirement, who have substantive collections uh, at institutions, and we do recognize that those institutions may not have the resources to um, to host those uh, samples indefinitely, and so we are uh, brokering arrangements with um, uh, uh, organizations such as geological surveys to actually store those samples or host those samples and to make them available. So I think uh, in the future uh, we're going to see much more of a of a consolidated effort to preserving samples which are. Uh, precious and if they're not registered in IGSN no one will know that they exist so I think it's one of those uh, chicken and egg things we just need to uh, start registering samples if you think your your samples are important and, and and you'd like to share them then make them recognizable thank you Brent and that actually takes us to the end of our time and um, unfortunately we do have some unanswered questions so we'll attempt to respond to those um, offline to the individuals who have asked them. Um, before closing, I'd just like to say a, a big thank you to all our presenters today and uh, to our audience for their participation. The fact that we didn't get through all the questions uh, suggests that there is a lot of interest in this topic. Um, and uh, uh, please, I would encourage you to have a look at the information um, about the service and about IGSN that it is available um, on the ANS website and to uh, contact us if you have any questions uh, about using the service or about IGSN. Uh, we hope to see you at a future uh, ARDC event. Uh, we do have quite a series of webinars and events that you can find uh, on the ANS website. Thank you again to our presenters and have a great afternoon. <laughs>